What is up heroes, this is Midnight Zero and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton and the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, we continued our way through the town chasing after Claudia, solved some interesting puzzles, and we're just about to get to the park. So, actually, I guess I should let the game summarize for itself. Our story so far. The Professor and Luke make their way successfully to Reinhold Manor where they meet Lady Dahlia. But before they can start talking, a loud noise startles Lady Dahlia's cat Claudia who runs off. The Professor and Luke are now forced to find the missing feline. And that takes us here. Okay. Um, something I actually, I really appreciate when games do that because it's so easy to get lost when coming back to a game, especially in a game like this where there's a large, you know, bigger picture mystery that's trying to be, um, well, you're trying to solve, right? You're trying to put together bits of information you gather throughout the entirety of the game. So if you come back to it after a while, um, which is very possible when you're recording for a series like this, um, it, it helps you put everything together um, without obviously giving you the answer. It's just making sure you have all the information you need and likely would have had you played it in one spurt, for example. Anyways, um, I did make, I did adjust a couple settings, so there should be a little bit more of a performance boost. Um, I know some of you have noted the audio from the previous episodes at times, but regardless, let's, let's hop into it. We did a, we solved the puzzle down there by the trash. Um, I think the first, I, I think we'll just hop right into going after Claudia. We have the fish bones. Professor, there she is. Quickly then, use the fish bones. Here, Gladia, come here, girl. Meow. Meow. <laughs> 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 We've done it, Professor. Here she comes. Excellent. Now we can head back to Reinhold Manor. Great. It seems we've made a friend. Meow. So cute. I like cats. I'm definitely more of a dog person than a cat person, but I absolutely love cats. And for those of you that know Lizzie, um, my, my girlfriend who is in the Danganronpa Let's Plays, uh, <laughs> she has a cat now as well. Anyways, we've now completed Chapter 2, so that's exciting. Having successfully caught Claudia, Professor Layton and Luke decide to head back to Reinhold Manor. Also, wow, I've been wanting to play this game so much, my voice is really becoming the limiting factor even after some rest. I can feel it scratchy, so I'm, I'm gonna have to take a break at some point. Wow, no, I don't want to though. Are you becoming accustomed to moving around and investigating St. Mysterie? Here's some advice to keep your investigation running smoothly. Some puzzles will disappear from their location in town as the story progresses. What? But there's no need to worry. Most of the unsolved puzzles are sent to Granny Riddleton's shack in the village square. Visit often to track down puzzles you passed up and work toward completing every puzzle in the game. Whew! That was something I was genuinely very worried about. I'm very much a completionist, and I really enjoy the puzzles, right? I don't want to actually miss out on any. So it is reassuring to know that a lot of them, most of them rather, will be brought to the house of puzzles should I miss them. If there are any, yeah, I guess if there are any puzzles that if I miss will not be accessible ever again, that is one of the few things I would say, please let me know about that um, so that I don't miss that by accident. And when doing so, try to provide context or instructions that don't reveal what's going on in the game or even necessarily, you know, what event is happening. Um, just say like, oh, when, you know, you get to a certain event, at this point, um, and you enter this room, uh, and you'll notice this part or this like item in this room, uh, make sure you click on that or, or something like that. Um, just, yeah, try to be very careful to make sure that I don't know what's going on in the game at that time, but I will recognize the moment when it arrives. Obviously very difficult to do, but, but it would very much be appreciated because I do not want to miss out on any of these expertly crafted puzzles. Okay, so puzzle 17, five card shuffle was sent to Granny Riddleton's shack. So we must have missed that at some point. I don't know where, don't know where it would have been, but good to know. Something doesn't seem quite right, Professor. P -p Professor, oh, it's simply awful. Come quickly, please. Lady Dahlia's been murdered. What's the matter, Matthew? If you're worried about the cat, we've brought her back safe and sound. Oh, well, Madame will be very happy to hear that. But this is no time to worry about a cat. Just hurry upstairs, right this way, please. Uh-oh, what's going down upstairs? Chelmy. Okay, so you're the famous Professor Layton, then. The name's Chelmy, Inspector Chelmy. I'm the inspector on this case. Oh, really, now? Wouldn't have guessed it. Well, I'd hardly call it a case. If this is about Claudia, we've brought her back safe and sound. That chin, though. <laughs> oh, Claudia, my baby. Mama missed you so much. <laughs> What's this cat doing here? Why on earth would you bring an animal into a crime scene? Have some sense. 
We were out when this crime took place and don't know what's going on. Could you please fill us in? Ooh, that's, this would be very much appreciated. There's been a murder, Professor. A man was killed here. What? Who was murdered? The victim was a resident of this address, one Simon Reinhold. Simon was... murdered. Approximately two hours ago, I received a report that a man had collapsed at Reinhold Manor. Wow, Simon was murdered. Can't say I'm sad, but... <laughs> Upon arrival at the scene, it was apparent to me that Simon was already dead. I see, and the cause of death? I'm currently conducting an investigation to look into it. I'll just let you know right now, Mr. Layton, I'm looking at you as a potential suspect as well. Fair enough. The rest of the details concerning this investigation are classified. Speaking of the details, who placed the call to the authorities? Are your ears clogged? You deaf? Didn't I just tell you those details are classified? Hmm? Alright everyone, I'll be taking statements from each of you in the other room. Come in one by one. And let me make this clear, under no circumstances is anyone to leave until I've talked to everyone. Okay, I mean, we obviously have a, a an alibi for what we're going to, uh, for where we can go, or where we were during the time of the murder, um, but who, who would have murdered Simon? I can't imagine he had very many friends, given his personality, but to the point of, you know, wanting to murder, right? That makes a very big difference. What's the motive? I don't know. And then, of course, uh, because naturally, as the puzzle solvers we are, we're probably going to play a role in putting things together. So let's chat with, I believe, Brandon? <laughs> Not quite. Matthew, <laughs> did you notice any strange characters around the manor at the time of the incident? Not a soul, I'm afraid. We obviously saw that villain earlier, but I didn't, I didn't realize villains in this game would be murderers. The aesthetic, I guess, lends this type of story to what I expected to be something like a, oh, they, I don't know, I don't even know, some, like, completely innocent crime that just is, you know, put, like, a downer for the day or something. I didn't even know about Master Simon until Inspector Chelmy showed up. And where's Simon's body now? I didn't see this, but I was told that the Inspector carried the body out shortly after arriving. I see. Well, it looks like for the moment we are without a lead on this case. It's very odd for him to remove the body from the scene of the crime, right? You would typically leave it there, inspect it there in the context of the of the scene, and if you're the first person to arrive to a scene and then alter it before other people have the chance to inspect it, that's that's very suspicious. Ah, uh, but you know, I found this in the room where Master Simon's body was discovered. Huh. What is this? This is the the bridge cog, right? So, what is what is worth noting? I remember that somebody came by and swiped one of the cogs from the bridge uh, that we heard. We heard about that from I think Franco, I believe. And then obviously there's the large noise thudding um, that we heard earlier that scared Claudia. So, we'll see. What is this? I'm sorry to say I have no idea, but I thought it might be a clue, so I made sure to hold on to it and thus obstruct the ins inspector from actually finding it. Amazing, it's a cog so small that one could search the room and miss it. Look, it has an engraving. Dropped cogs. It was added to your list of mysteries. Okay. A small cog? Now that you mention it, I know a puzzle about an object that almost fits that description. What? Are you joking? A puzzle at a time like this? <laughs> Leave it to Layton, right? Alright, find the dot. You are holding an eight-pointed shape with a red dot on it. If you hold the shape so that the red dot is in the position shown in diagram A, then flip it over, you'll see a black dot as depicted below. Okay, now assume you are holding the shape as shown on the left side of diagram B. Where will the black dot be when you flip the shape over? Draw a circle around where you think the black dot would go. Okay, so this is a, what's it called? Um, sort of spatial reasoning puzzle. Um, I will admit that it's probably one of my weaker aspects, um, but let's let's take a look at these diagrams real quick. So in A, that red dot is at the very top, and when you flip it over, right to the like turquoise-ish side, um, that black dot will be on the far left. Meaning in the upper left diagram, the black dot is actually two dots, or like two points to the right of the red one, right? So, in this case, what we can do is, if we look at diagram B on the left, we can go clockwise two vertices, two points, 
and in this that means it'll be in like the the southwest vertex however it's on the other side so then when we flip it um, around the I guess like the y-axis it'll then oh it, interestingly it, it looks like it would just switch places with the red dot so it would be where the red dot actually is um, described in diagram B I think that's right I think what's tempting, right, what's tempting is to rotate it along the same axis. It was rotated in diagram A, and thus claim it would be in like the northeast dot position in the final answer, because that's how it moves in the original rotation. But I think if you're, if you're moving it along that axis, right, and we can see the axis by connecting the two fingers that are holding the two points, right? So I think it will just um, go to where the red dot is originally, because the black dot should be on the other side, two points to the right of the red dot. If you kind of undo the rotation, right? If you undo the rotation, yeah, um, I'm pretty confident it'll be it'll be this guy here. When you rotate it like that. Let's give it a go. I, I think I think Luke, that's the way to go. Answer. All right. <laughs> like I said, I'm a little bit has an answer. I'm a little bit unsure about the the spatial reasoning. I mean, like I'm not awful at it, but but I just want to be extra sure, I guess. That's right. Take a look at the diagram for the answer. Okay. I guess I should have waited a little bit for those of you that wanted to take a look at the diagrams. That may have been more helpful, but. My apologies, but I'm afraid I don't know anything that would aid your investigation, <laughs> but I do know another puzzle related to it. <laughs> Not at all. This small gear is more than enough for us to go on. But I do wonder why you're giving this to us. I believe you are a good man, Professor. I'm confident you will put the whole of this puzzle together. Ah, uh, thank you. I appreciate the vote of confidence, Matthew. <laughs> and we got ourselves another gizmo. Okay, we still need probably like four or five more gizmos to really put things together, but let's chat with... was it Gordon? It was. Imagine, a murder in this very house. It brings a chill to my spine, it does. You're a detective, are you not? Do hurry and find the monster that did this. My good sir, I am no detective, but I agree that your concerns are certainly warranted. No one is safe until that criminal is behind bars. My sentiments, exactly. I just don't understand it. Simon could be snide, but he wasn't the type to be hated. Yeah, that's what we were saying earlier. If the criminal was after my brother's fortune, I could very well be this fiend's next target. The question is... Still, what's the motive here, right? Because if somebody murdered them, they maybe perceive them as a threat, as somebody who would find the golden apple before them, right? Um, the other thing, though, is from a logical perspective, if you anticipate somebody's more likely to find the golden apple than you are, you would instead stalk them, right? You would wait for them or watch them as they attempt to find the golden apple, and then when they do find the golden apple, kill them and take the golden apple. Obviously, maybe then the, the motive is a little bit too clear at that point, and despite finding the golden apple and potentially the estate, you're very clearly labeled as a murderer. Um, but I, I don't know 100% how... I mean, you could obviously, you know, kind of compromise, right? And do some amount of following, of studying to figure out some of the top clues or have some better ideas and then get rid of, you know, the competition. But regardless, Gordon is rightly, um, rightfully concerned. You have a point. If we narrow the motive to stealing the Reinhold fortune, there are few potential suspects. Good gracious, you don't think I'd do something like this now? Simon and I got along very well, I'll have you know. He wasn't very close with Augustus, though. Augustus. Is there... is there some sort of... Ah, uh, I can't... I don't see it, but some sort of, like... Brutus and and Caesar and I mean obviously that was Julius Caesar not Augustus but maybe maybe there's some reference hidden in there I don't know you know all this talk of families has me contemplating a puzzle I once heard <laughs> of course I knew it <laughs> not that I'm complaining bickering brothers okay six brothers have gathered around a table to eat dinner each of the brothers is prone wow a lot of description each of the brothers is prone to fighting with the siblings directly above and below him in age, and can't be seated next to either of them. 
Also, brothers three and five got into an argument the other day and refused to sit next to each other. The eldest brother, brother one, has already sat down at the big table and is waiting on the others to start eating. Can you find a seating arrangement that will keep everyone from fighting with each other? Okay. Um, so let's at least start by looking at the seats immediately next to brother number one, right? Um, brother one is the eldest, brother six will be the youngest, right? Brother one um, cannot be seated next to the brother directly below him in age, right? So in this case, neither of those can be brother number two, right? Um, and then the question is, okay, which of the follow of the remaining three seats would brother two belong to? And um, I'm sure we'll get to that in a moment. But for the time being, any the, those two green top chairs could be three, four, five, or six, right? Let's think of other combinations though, because I think the brothers three and five, I think brother three is gonna be the key here because brother three will have the most restrictions. Brother three can't be next to two, cannot be next to four and cannot be next to five, right? So brother two actually needs to be next to brother number one and number six. And so if that's the case, Brother two has to be in one of the top two green chairs, and brother six has to be in one of the bottom two orange chairs. We don't know which one yet, although admittedly it doesn't really matter because there's symmetry to this. So what we can do is put brother two there and brother six here, right? Yeah, brother three definitely has the most restrictions. Again, can't be next to five, can't be next to four, can't be next to two. Oh wait, why did I why did I say two? Um, yeah, so brother three can't be next to four, can't be next to five, and can't be next to two. So it has to be next to one and six. Those are the only two options. So brother three has to be one of the top two green ones, and brother six then has to be sandwiching, I guess, brother three with brother one. And then um, we can make a lot of progress from here, right? Because this top right green one cannot be brother two. Um, so two is one of the lower right or, you know, um, direct lower south uh, chairs. And we look at brother six, right? Brother six cannot be next to brother five. So five must be one of the top two um, chairs. And then we say four cannot be next to five. So four and five must be polar opposite, which means, which means four, I think has to be here or four can't be there, right? Um, because four and five cannot be next to each other. And so if four is in the middle, five will no matter what be, be next to um, him. So four is in one of the two remaining green chairs, right? Two is in one of the um, bottom two chairs. And then five is in one of the top two chairs. So the question then is, which which would work? Um, I guess maybe there are multiple solutions here. I'm used to playing Sudoku where there's only, where there's almost always a unique solution, but I guess what we could do is look and see if there are any contradictions, right? So for example, if I were to place two here and, um, well, no, I can't do that exactly, right? I guess four can't be in the center because five will be next to it either way. Um, but then that also means four and five must have the farthest positions, right? Oh, that that's exactly it. Four and five can't be next to each other. So four and five form a pair um, that need to be in these two remaining green chairs. So two has to be in the remaining orange chair. And then obviously five can't be next to six. So five must be up there and four must be down there. So let's take a look real quick, just to check. One is not next to uh, two. So that's a check. Three is not next to two or four and not next to five, check. Six is not next to five, so that's a check. Four is not next to five or three, so that's a check. Two is not next to four and not next to, or not next to one and not next to three, so that's a check. And five is not next to six or four, so that's a check. I think, I think we're good. Let's reread the instructions real quick just to be safe. Have around a table, each of the brothers is prone to fighting, can't be seated next to either of them directly above and below an age, and then brother three and five. Okay, let's give it a go. 
I like that. That was that was the closest to Sudoku I've uh, <laughs> I've encountered so far in the game. Critical thinking is the key to success. I like that last step, right, where we had those last three, and then you had to realize that the two, I guess, remaining green shares formed a pair of four and five, which means that neither of those can be two, and the remaining one would have to be two. But all right, um, good job. Okay, and then yes, there is a symmetry to it because of the, the circle. I'm glad that that's also true. <laughs> ah, yes, so that's the answer. Thank you for clearing the, up that puzzle, but we're still no closer to finding Simon's killer. I assure you I had nothing to do with it, so please go out and find the real murderer. Of course. I understand your position. It appears I'm a suspect too. I'll find out what I can. And we get ourselves another gizmo. Okay. I want to inspect the environment real quick. I know we already checked out the chandelier. Could this be another Reinhold family portrait? Chandelier casts a lovely glow. Meeting in the rug? Well, no, but we'll chat with the inspector, I guess. Is this everyone who is present at the site of the crime? I believe we are missing Raymond, sir. Or Ramon, sir. Ramon! <laughs> oh, I'm gonna go with Raymond. Why would I do that every time? Where is he and what on earth is he doing? Matthew, fetch Raymond at once! To be honest, madam, thinking on it, I've not seen Raymond for a few hours now. What? Don't tell me he was taken as well. No, hold on a moment. He's a suspect too. Perhaps he fled the scene of his crime. Where could he be at a time like this? What if the murderer got Raymond too? It's very possible. And likewise, he could also be the murderer. Um, anything in the fireplace? No? Okay. Oh, does Gordon have something more to say now? Poor Simon murdered right here. I'm absolutely terrified. Bring this criminal to justice, I beg you. Okay, no, he, he doesn't really. So, I guess we'll head back. Wait a moment, Luke. Yes, Professor? There's something I'd like to discuss with Lady Dahlia. It shouldn't take very long at all. Okay. Where is Lady Dahlia, then? <laughs> do we have to chat with Brandon again? Not Brandon, Matthew. Why do I keep thinking his name is Brandon? <laughs> hey, where did Lady Dahlia go? I believe Madame has retired to the adjoining room to relax on her own. She's a strong woman, but it's only natural she'd need to rest after a terrible event like this. Very well, then. Would you please let her know that I have something I'd like to talk to her about? But of course, Professor. Please wait here. Lady Dahlia might act like an ice queen, but I guess even she was shaken by today's events. Luke, if you wish to ever become a true gentleman, you'll need to start showing a little more sensitivity. <laughs> oh, of course, Professor. I apologize. That was wrong of me. Luke is so funny. How old is Luke? Luke's gotta be a little kid. Madame, we'll see you now. Just head back through that doorway on the left. Alright. Sounds good. So this is her room. Naturally, we're going to inspect the room first. Anything of the drawers? chairs. We found a hint coin. How about this flower vase? What a lovely vase. Whoa, I better make sure I don't knock that over. How about these curtains back here? Those are some posh curtains. Doesn't appear to be anything of particular interest in here, so I guess we'll chat with uh, Lady Dahlia and see what she has to say. And what Professor Layton has to ask. Lady Dahlia, I have a deep suspicion this murder is connected to the mystery of the golden apple. What? <laughs> It's too early to say for sure, but I think that it's highly probable the two matters are linked. Is Leighton going to be used? You're going to use this as a means of saying I I would like to be informed on the investigation as this contributes to the the golden apple, right? Or as this pertains to the golden apple. And you think that Raymond is somehow involved in all this? Potentially, yes. However, as of yet, we don't have enough information to draw any solid conclusions. I see. If that's the case, then I have a request for you, Professor. Find Raymond and bring him back here to me. It sickens me that I am being considered a suspect in this brutal crime. I must prove my innocence at once. As you wish, Lady Dahlia. We will ask around town to see what we can find. I appreciate your help, Professor. Well then, I'll be waiting the good news in the parlor. Okay, so I guess out in the town we go, looking for Raymond. The missing servant. Comb St. Mysterio for clues about Raymond's disappearance. And sure, we'll save our progress. That sounds good to me. Interesting. Alright, now is there anything else? I knew it. That frame looks suspicious on the right. <laughs> hmm? Wow. So, there's a picture frame with Matthew, Lady Dahlia, um, a daughter, and then is that... Was that Ingrid? Or Agnes? Ingrid? I don't know. <laughs> Look at this picture. What is it, Professor? Oh, isn't that Lady Dahlia? She's holding a baby. That baby must be Baron Reinhold's daughter, then. 
Flora was her name, wasn't it? Gosh, what a cute baby. <laughs> Lady Dolly hasn't changed much, much, has she? Or she's just gotten more effective makeup. <laughs> you know, Luke, they say true beauty never ages. I suppose so, Professor. But even so, it makes me wonder. Maybe we can ask Lady Dahlia about it. Alright. Seems good to me. Anything in the drawers in the back here, that plant. Maybe now we can interact with the base or these flowers or whatever it may be. There's really no other puzzle hidden in here? Okay. I mean, I, I guess... I guess that works. I'm surprised, but that's okay. Let's chat with Lady Dahlia about the picture frame. Pardon me, but we happened upon an adorable picture of you and your daughter, Flora, a moment ago. I beg your pardon? The picture of you holding a baby, the one that sits in the next room? I'm sorry, but you must be mistaken. I've never had any children. Huh? My apologies, madam. I must have been mistaken. At any rate, time is of the essence here. Go find Raymond and bring him back, would you? Who was that, then? If that's not Lady Dolly in the photograph, then who on earth could it be? I think we'd do well to ask the butler a few questions. Perhaps he can clear this up for us. Yeah, no kidding. Um, we'll definitely want to chat with the butler, but let's chat with the inspector real quick first. By the way, Mr. Lane, I hear you're something of a puzzle connoisseur. This puzzle was popular in London when I left. I wonder if you have what it takes to solve it. Alright, I guess we're hopping on to Puzzle 29. Five suspects. Okay, five suspects are called in police headquarters for questioning. They give the following statements, A, B, C, D, and E. A, one of the five of us is lying. B, two of the five of us are lying. C, I know these guys and three of the five of us are lying. D, don't listen to a word they say. Out of the five of us, four are lying. Five, and E, all five of us are dirty, rotten liars. <laughs> okay. The police only want to release the suspects who are telling the truth. How many people should they let go? Okay. So we got some reasoning to do, right? Let's, analyze, er, let's analyze this statement by statement. The first of which I want to look at is E's statement of all five of us are dirty, rotten liars. This is clearly um, a paradox. If this statement is, um, well, it's only a paradox if it's a true statement, right? If you think about, oh, if E is telling the truth, then all five of us are dirty, rotten liars, and that means E must also be a liar, thus, um, that's a, or that's a contradiction, and thus E must be lying. So E is one liar, which means that the, her statement, in this case, is not true. All five of us are dirty, rotten liars, meaning the answer is not zero. There, um, there is somebody telling the truth, and it's not E. So I wish I could like note that down. Can I do that? Oh, nice, we can draw a nice X on E. She is lying. Um, now let's look at D's statement. Don't listen to a word they say. Out of the five of us, four are lying. Can we work with that for now? Hmm. Can we work with that now? I feel like, hmm. Let's go, let's go with D, actually. So don't listen to a word they say. Out of the five of us, four are lying. We know one of the liars is E, right? So of the remaining four, A, B, C, D, three of them would be lying if this is true. If this is true. And so then we say, if this is true, A, B, and C must all be lying, right? Now, this is kind of like an interpretation question, right? When we look at A and B's statements, are they necessarily mutually exclusive, right? One of the five of us is lying is technically true if two people are lying. I think the intent here is to say exactly one of the five of us is lying and exactly two of the five of us are lying. Similarly, exactly four of us are lying and exactly three of us are lying um, to imply that, you know, um, for example, if three people were lying, saying one of us is lying is technically true, though in this case, I think the intent is to say exactly one. So that's what I'm going to work with for now and see if that leads anywhere. So again, D's statement, out of the five of us, four are lying. We know E is a liar. And if D is telling the truth, A, B, and C must all be lying, right? Meaning the opposite of what they say must be true, right? Or rather, 
It's not one of us is lying. It's not two of us are lying. And it's not three of us are lying. That would be consistent. That would be consistent, right? A is asserting one of us is lying. B is asserting two of us are lying. And C is asserting three of us are lying. And so if D is telling the truth and says four are lying, that's actually true. So I think that's actually going to be the statement we want to work with. And it'll thus be one. The answer would be one. D would be telling the truth. However, just, just for the sake of completeness, let's look at A, B, and C. C. I know these guys and three of the five of us are lying. If this is true, if we assume C is true, we know E is lying, which means of A, B, and D, two of them would need to be lying. Right? Meaning, rather, one of them would also be telling the truth. Which, I guess, would only be the case if, um, well, I guess that can't be the case, right? <laughs> well, actually, now this becomes a lot simpler. <laughs> if you consider these as term, the terms like exactly, right? One, and exactly two, and exactly three, etc. Well, then, of course, only one of them can be telling the truth, right? Um, so the answer is always going to be one, but in terms of who was telling the truth, it would have to be D. It could probably get a little bit more complicated... It gets more complicated if you don't consider it as exactly, right? Because... Ooh, that gets really complicated. <laughs> that gets a lot more complicated. We know E is lying because um, it's definitely not all five, right? So somebody is telling the truth. And D, again, would still be consistent. But then A would also be true, right? If four people were lying, then one, two, and three would also be lying. But obviously that doesn't work because then we run out of people who would be technically lying and people who would be telling the truth. And C, if three people were lying, then one and two, A or A and B, would also be telling the truth, right? So if three people are lying, then A and B would be telling the truth and C would be telling the truth and we run out of three people. So that wouldn't work. Um, if B is telling the truth and two of the five of us are lying and we don't consider it as exactly again, um, then A and B would be telling the truth and C, D, and E would be lying. And then B would be false. And then if A were telling the truth, it would be one of the five of us is lying. If that were the truth, um, then B, C, D, and E are, are all lying. Um, but then that contradicts the statement A. Okay, so it's not meant to be, it is meant to be interpreted as exactly. Because <laughs> we've, we've tried the other option and exhausted that. So, sorry if that was um, long-winded. Um, hopefully it was interesting, I guess, if for those of you that hadn't considered whether or not they were being, you know, precise or accurate with the terminology here and, and the intent to be exactly one or exactly two. But we explored both options and I'm fairly confident that D is the only person telling the truth here. So, how many people should they let go? One person, because one person is telling the truth, and that person is D. Let's try it. There we go. Awesome. I Every think... puzzle has an answer. <laughs> what was Professor Layton's, Layton's uh, statement that one time? It was like, don't overthink things or what's implied because you'll overcomplicate things or whatever. I think that's what just happened with this 20 picarat puzzle. <laughs> That's right, every suspect accused a different number of people. If anyone was telling the truth, it had to be one suspect, no more or less. The only suspect whose statement fits that condition is D. It looks like he's a free man now. Okay, yeah, so we, we, we got there. Just wanted to be extra, extra safe. Hmm, I suppose I should have given you a tougher puzzle to solve. You do best to use that brain of yours to find that golden apple everyone is abuzz about. And we got ourselves another gizmo. Okay. Let's take a look at our gizmos, by the way. Okay. We can add all of this, and wow, we are... We are making some good progress. 
Okay, um, anything we want to do with the painting, the inn, I forget what we do at the inn. Should I take a look at the journal? Touch an entry to reading it. Oh, these are just sort of story updates, I believe. Right? Mysteries. Interesting. There are only like ten or so of them. Okay, and then the inn is for all... Oh, that's right. That's for all the things that we collect. Um, okay. So, we have asked Lady Dahlia about this other person that supposedly exists. Maybe his sister. Um, maybe, maybe some brainwashing going on. But in the meantime, we now need to go find Raymond. So, that is what we're going to do. And we should be chatting with Matthew <laughs> about this other Lady Dahlia. Ah, uh, Matthew, do you have a moment? Certainly, sir. How can I help you? It's about the picture of Lady Dolly upstairs, the one of her holding a small child. Ah, yes, about that old picture. That's not Lady Dolly, I'm afraid. It's a picture of Baron Reinhold's former wife. But I certainly understand why you would mistake one for the other. Why did they look so similar? They were virtually identical in their appearance, their gesture, and even in the way they moved. I mean, I guess... I guess Baron Reinhold had a, uh, had a type, right? <laughs> so that photo isn't of Lady Dahlia, but of an earlier wife of the Baron? Wow, imagine finding someone who looks that much like you. What are the odds? Is there a chance that you were relatives of one another? I've never heard anything to suggest as much, sir. It just happened one day. The Baron arrived home, and at his side was Lady Dahlia. I'm sorry to say that's all I really know about the matter. That is super strange. Not at all. You've been most helpful. Thank you, Matthew. So, had one wife. What happened to the first wife? How odd. The more I hear, the stranger the whole affair starts to sound. Yeah, Lady Dahlia is indeed a mystery worth attempting to solve. Um, anything else? We already, I'm pretty sure we looked at this painting already, but is there now a puzzle here? Or Baron Augustus Reinhold? Okay. How about over here? Any of these paintings? No, I guess, I guess not. So, we'll head on out. Keep on looking. There's Claudia. What does Claudia have for us? Is she holding something? Yeah, what are those? Hmm? <laughs> are we gonna have to find something else? These are... These are Simon's glasses. But how on earth did they end up here? This could be a key clue in the investigation. I'd think it best if we brought this to Inspector Chelmy. What's the matter, Mr. Layton? Inspector, take a look at these. These glasses belong to Simon. We found them out in the garden. What the? Hm. I imagine they simply fell off the body when it was being carried out of the village. Besides, if you have enough time to manage the village lost and found, shouldn't you be searching for the Reinhold inheritance or whatever it is you're supposed to be doing? I feel like Chelmy is the murderer here. Dis I like immediately dismissing an important clue like this. Of course, if you continue to interrupt my investigation, I have some ideas about what you can do. My sincerest apologies, Inspector. <laughs> I don't like that chummy one bit. <laughs> you and me both, Luke. He reeks of smoke and he's so full of himself. And the way he treats you, Professor, it's just too much. Luke, my boy, pay it no mind. Right now we have other priorities. Let's go ask, or ask around town and find Raymond. Alright, I guess, I guess that's what we'll do. But very interesting. And, oh, this Agnes? Look at you fretting away there. Whatever's the matter? Sorry to trouble you, but did you see Raymond around here today? He was here until just a while ago. No, I can't say I've seen him today, which is strange, considering how often he sneaks off the job. But enough of that, how often he sneaks off the job. Interesting. I hear you're quite an ace with puzzles. Would you mind helping me out with the puzzle I've been mulling over? Oh, right now? We're sort of in the middle of something right now. But if you insist, I am <clears throat> Professor Layton, after all. One line puzzle, one. One? Oh, it's the start of a series, I guess. Have you heard of one-line puzzles? The idea is to place your pen to paper and draw a shape without lifting your pen from the pad or retracing any part of the line. You can, however, cross lines. Now that you're familiar with the concept, look at the four pictures below. One of them cannot be drawn with one line. Which one is it? Interesting. Um, so... Some of these shapes are really complicated, um, but this is actually 
really cool math. Um, this is a problem Euler solved a long time ago. It's called the, the Bridges of Konigsberg, for those of you that are interested. Um, so actually, what I want to do is count how many, I guess, paths there are, or bridges there are, to each point on these pictures. So for example, in this house one, there are three. Please redraw your circle. Oh, sorry, I'm not, not trying to draw a circle, but okay. Um, so there's three up here. We'll just have to be okay with that. <laughs> Please redraw your circle being there. There's three where I just marked the dot. There's two here, four, three, and then five. One, two, three, four, um, five, six, four, three, four, three. So I'm fairly confident this is the one that can't be redrawn or can't be drawn um, because in order to draw a shape without picking up your pencil or retracing anything like that, um, you need to, st it either needs to have all vertices that are even um, in terms of the number of paths going to and from them. So that's what I was just counting here. Or you have to have exactly two odd vertices. Because basically for any point on the graph, you need to have one entrance and one exit, except for the starting point and the end point. So because this lower left one has multiple odd vertices, I think that this is going to be the one that you can't draw. We could look at all of the intersections in like the top left one, for example. So we have an intersection here that has four, this has four, this has four, this has four, this has four, and this has four. So this is something you should theoretically be able to draw. Similarly, let's look at the car. Um, we'll start by the windshield. So this vertex has three, and this has three, and now we should expect evens on all these. So this is four, 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 and four. So you would start here, and you would end up over here, but that should be drawable as well. Now let's take a look at this one here. So we have, I mean, this one here is um, negligible uh, because it just, you know, is like one line on the end. But this is three, man, okay. Three, and then we have four, 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 and then two. And then all the bends are obviously two. Two, 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 etc. My battery is low. <laughs> I didn't even realize it wasn't plugged in. Sorry, guys. Hopefully, that didn't affect performance too much. That would be unfortunate. Um, but yeah, because there's this one here and then there's the three, I think. Yeah, I think if you started at this three, you could get through this whole thing and then end at the one because they're exactly two odd vertices. So in the end, I'm going to go with this lower left one because it has multiple odd vertices. And again, if this um, if this is something that interests you, look it up Euler, that's E-U-L-E-R, uh, the Bridge of Konigsberg problem. Actually, um, on YouTube, there's a channel I watch called Number File that has a really cool video on it. Um, because yeah, it's interesting. So let's let's give it a go. Hopefully after doing all of that, I get it right. Well, <laughs> Didn't mess it up somehow, but yeah, okay, nice. Every puzzle has an answer. Cool. Very nice. There's actually a very easy way to tell whether or not a given picture has been drawn in one stroke. This method will be revealed to you after you solve one more of these riddles. Okay. I'd imagine it has to do with exactly what I mentioned, but that's okay. That's some fine work there. I was stuck on this puzzle for I don't know how long. Ah, you there, boy. I just had a terrible vision of you running into trouble tonight. So be careful out there, alright? Oh, I mean, I, I guess... I guess we'll be on the alert. Well, that was a welcome piece of news. <laughs> but don't worry about me, because I don't scare easily. Found another gizmo. Awesome. Cool. So that was that was actually a really fun um, puzzle. I love every opportunity I get to talk about math. <laughs> so that was that was fun, and I think that's a good stopping point for now. So in the next episode, we are going to continue our search for Raymond, and and hopefully investigate a bit more. You know, Simon's murder, this Lady Dahlia, and the Baron's former wife, and that mystery. There's there's a lot a lot of perplexing aspects of this Saint Mystere town. And it's many inhabitants, or not so many inhabitants, actually. 
and um, I'm eager to find out more. The more I play this game, the more I love it. Um, the puzzles are really fun, they're creative, they test you in different ways, the aesthetic, the characters, uh, all, all that stuff, and I hope you guys are enjoying it too. I <laughs> just want to play more, but I feel like my voice at this point is starting to get scratchy and my throat's starting to get sore, so I'm going to have to take a break, unfortunately. But until the next episode, this is Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.